Did you have that sense that you were, because your life has been one of service and you've, you've done an astounding number of things. Um, was that an intention? I think it kind of happened. Um, I've been very fortunate to be at places that have opened doors and, and given me experiences, I mean, from one end of the earth to the other. Um, I thank my kupuna because they, they planned it, you know, and I'm just walking that path. Puna Dawson often happened to be in the right place at the right time, meeting remarkable people. Was it chance or part of a greater design? Puna Dawson, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one, -on -one, engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Cecilia Ann Camille Kiki Lani Wahine Ali'i O Puna Kalama Dawson, better known as Puna, is a Hawaiian cultural practitioner on Kauai. She's the second oldest and first daughter born into a family of 11 children on Oahu. Descended from Hawaiian Ali'i, her parents taught her as she was growing up that like her ancestors, her life purpose must be to serve the people. While she did not seek to meet prominent and extraordinary individuals, they certainly crossed her path in surprising ways in surprising places. Who else can say they were called to give a man a ride on Kauai and it turned out to be the Dalai Lama? More on that later. She lives in Anahola and Lihue, Kauai, but grew up in Kailua on the windward side of Oahu. Kailua was a big place close to the ocean. I mean, that, I think that was um, what our life was all about. Um, and my family, you know, when I look back at all of my siblings, my parents had playmates for us <laughs> because they had so many. Um, and we were poor, but we just didn't know how we were poor. Um, being there in Kailua, there, it was a rich community of people that really knew one another, that um, saw each other at church, walking to and from you know, school. Um, the people of that time are names that you read about in today's time. But they were aunties and uncles, and everybody knew everyone. And, and now it seems so odd that you would just that anyone who describes themselves as poor would live right, you, you, you live behind what is now uh, Buzz's Steakhouse and uh, right across from the beach park and um, now it's a whole different uh, upscale neighborhood. Oh, it sure is. But back then, you know, in one of the homes that we lived, my dad grew everything. And he, um, he was a cook. My mom was the princess. But um, he grew everything, and he taught us to respect and appreciate the ocean because that was our icebox. Our house was a one-bedroom house. With 11, children, with 11 at, children? Up to 11 at, at a time. 11 children. My dad was a man of many trades, and he worked with, uh, um, he was able to build us steel bunk beds. So we had three bunk beds a day bed for one of the children, and then a crib. And we all lived in this one bedroom. I mean, all the children did. My parents slept in the living room. He made that bed, too. Um, and we had a closet that was about this big, and a bathroom, and, and a hallway kitchen. <laughs> I call it a hallway kitchen because that's exactly what it was. It was a hallway. It's a small house, but a lot of love. <laughs> and just, did, did you want to go home or did you feel cramped in home? Oh, no. I thought everybody lived like <laughs> us. And we always had extra people. We, uh, my dad, you know, I think he, um, all the people that kind of grew up, Whitey Hawkins, all these uncles and aunties that um, he knew from the ocean, came home, brought them home, and children. So when you were a child, your, your home was full of people who had uh, lots of a range of backgrounds and uh, came to eat, came to socialize. Uh, my dad, yes. Dad, your dad would... My dad and my mom. Um, you know, because my mother was a hula person, we always had hula people there. 
back then, a Lucky Lux show, you know, we'd go and perform. Auntie Janoa would play music. The B sisters would play music. My dad, between his fishermen and friends, um, we lived down the road from Don Ho. We lived, you know, in Waimanalo as Uncle Gabby. But it wasn't unusual for them to show up at our house in Kanikapila in the front yard. And my dad was a boat builder, so we had, he built so many boats. And last count, he built 16 boats, and he gave them all away. And these were big, sandpan style, you know. The people who would come to our house would not just play music, but, you know, talk story, and talk story. <laughs> and um, so our life was full and rich. Auntie Iolani Luahine came to your house, and I mean, you, you've seen her dance in person. Um, you know, she, she's no longer with us, and not a lot of um, pictures even remain of her, especially uh, moving pictures. But they say she was seemed like she was possessed by another presence when she danced. Did you? She was see dedicated that? to hula, and um, of that time, you know, when you look and read about the history of that time. Um, I had no idea we were living in that time because she was part of it. Um, Yolani came on my mother's birthday and asked in, if my mother would go and chant for her at the beach. And um, so we went and she danced right there at the water's edge, right at the mouth of um, Kauai Nui, the river. And, um, Kailua, and she danced there. And you know, when you say that she's possessed, it's like she's from another time. It was as though she was on top of the water, at the water's edge, just floating. When she, because of her dedication, when she became this other person, it was um, a real gift to, to me in my memory because it helped me understand the histories of past. So, so here you are, I mean, treated to this amazing dancer while um, also you're off to St. Anthony's School, Catholic <laughs> School in Kailua with your long hair down to the, your ankles, Big bound up bush. behind your, your head. <laughs> A bush. <laughs> My dad didn't want us cutting our hair, so our hair was big. Anyway, at St. Anthony's, again, at the right place at the right time. You know, Hedwig von Trapp was- Okay, stop nurse. right there. Hedwig von Trapp was your teacher, and yes. who was she? Hedwig von Trapp of the von Trapp family. She came to school in her dwindle and her- The kerchief, sound of music the family. The sound of music. The, the actual, <laughs> the one of the actual, kids yes, grown up. the actual. And you know, she was, she was a gift to the school by Auntie, um, uh, Malia Meyer's mother found this woman, brought her to her school. They were so, so involved with uh, education and she became our music teacher. So, you know, Mihana, Aluli, and uh, all of us going to school there, we learned from this woman, besides, of course, Auntie Ermgard, but um, we learned from this woman about harmony and voice projection. We didn't know we were having voice lessons. It was what she demanded of us at the time. But, you know, I attribute my uh, ability to hear harmony to that woman. And what a gift. Puna Dawson's family life revolved around the ocean, whether it was boat building, fishing, or especially canoe paddling. As much as her mother expected her to follow in her hula footsteps, paddling always came first for her. Yet her life experiences, guided by her relationship with her mother and other Hawaiian cultural practitioners, pushed her in another direction. I love sandboarding at the mouth of the river. That was my favorite sport. And um, canoeing. And you know, our, our, all our family were canoe paddlers canoe builders, makers, and my passion was canoeing. <laughs> and I'd show up for hula with my hair wet and show up there, and I never thought I was going to be a kumu hula of any kind. In fact, I'm really lazy, um, but I never thought 
because I believed that my mother was going to live forever. But not too long after that, my aunt, Mikey Ayu, passed away. She and my mother were um, two pieces in a pod and um, were both uh, graduates of anti Lia Montgomery. And so they did everything together. But it was such a shock when Auntie passed away because it made me realize that that could happen to my mom too. And I will say that helped me uh, be more responsible. Because you, would, you were the next in line to be Kumuhula once your mom passed? No, I, it was, you know, never appreciating what is right around you. Mm. Never appreciating them. And that was a real um, wake-up call because my aunt was surrounded by beautiful people and, you know, and my mom too and my aunts, my other aunts, that when she passed, it shook us, all of us, but it shook me enough to say to my mom, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. You had, been the, you had been the daughter who wasn't showing oh, interest in Oh, no. I, I would say to my mom every time, oh, there's a new race, mom. We're making this <laughs> right after this race. I will show up. I, I promise you. I promise you. It's not easy, as everyone who ever goes to Kamehameha schools oh. knows. Not, not easy to make concert glee. You mm. did so. What was that like? Because it did take you many places. It did. You know, I'm going to say this on record. My best friend, I, I had the best friends in school. And Robert Cosmero was one of them, Ka'ohomo Kini. I mean, you know, all the names that you hear, Wayne Chang, all of these people who are the who's who's, and we're all part of um, this group. And Auntie Nona Beamer was our um, Hawaiian teacher. You must have thought that was really normal to have all these amazing people around you. Really. Um, and what happened was, um, at the right place at the right time, Kalani Cockett came and he saw the Hawaiian Ensemble our group and picked the whole group up and, you know, the rest is history. We became the Hawaiian Expression. And so we traveled, but we traveled with our teachers. Mr. Mokini, who taught science, was our musicians, the Bee Sisters, you know, all of these people that, that were known musicians of the time were part. Um, Barry Yap from Kauai, you know, uh, Beverly Noah, Ed Kenny. Wow. I mean, <laughs> these, these people They were, would travel with you and work travel. with you and sing. We would show that, we, you know, we'd show up in Belgium, we'd show up in Paris, Every place that, that Pan American flew, um, we had a show there. And we were housed um, in Zurich, and a group of us, you know, we were, it was like a pod. And um, it, it was wonderful because we were at places that you only read about, you know. Do you think, I mean, was Hawaii small enough now that many other people had these experiences, or were they coming to you because your family was so involved in, in the community? I think it was just timing, and I say it all the time. It's just timing. Um, all the places that I've been and continue to go to, it, in the name of aloha, is an expression that my mom uh, used. What happened was she saw so many things being written about Hawaii, and she totally disagreed with it. And she became part of the Aloha Council, and with Auntie Pilahi Paki, they wanted to push to make sure that that idea and the, the flavor of Hawaii didn't disappear. And so my mom started to travel. And she chose the places that we still had agreements of peace. Germany. You know, if you look at Kalakaua and the things that he had made, peace agreements, Japan, all of these places, that's where she wanted to go. What were the original things that your mom heard that were being said incorrectly about oh. Hawaii that made her want to go on her mission? Oh, hula. <laughs> things about hula that just drove her crazy. All knowledge is not in one school. That's correct. But what was happening was things about huna about lua and especially about hula was being printed 
and printed in all these different languages, Japanese, you know, German, a lot of Swedish and things. And she, talking story with Auntie Bilahi, you know, they were, we got to do something about this. Well, what exactly bothered them? What was being said? Well, the, the practice of Huna, especially. Huna is not, Huna is in every culture, every culture. And the expression of unihipili, coming to your center, it's when you translate something that has no foundation and you create it. And that's what they saw. You know, in the expression, how the word aloha was turned around or um, expressed without thought, without foundation. I mean, the, the words itself, in that word aloha, it, it is so pronounced because it is the characteristics of who we are as a people. And in reference to huna, huna is not something that you can really learn. It is there in you. And different people are, are able to help to bring it forth. I believe that that was really what uh, bothered them the most. And my mother said, my grandchildren, great-grandchildren are going to be reading this and believing it. If we don't speak out against it, if we don't show the other side of the picture, right, correct the record, right, then, you know, we're at fault. So it became a mission of hers in her later years to try to, you know, create that Julio. After high school, Puna Dawson assisted her mother teaching hula in Kailua while remaining an avid paddler and helping to build the sport. She followed her husband, Kalani Dawson, to Kauai when he was assigned a short-term job on the island. And she was there when Hurricane Eva hit, which extended her husband's stay. Commuting back and forth between Oahu and Kauai after that, she became part of the Kauai community until moving there permanently. Then a second hurricane hit. My husband worked for the telephone company and he went to install all of the PBX in Poipu. The very following week, um, Eva hit and then we were on loan to the island and um, getting ready to come home and then Iniki hit. 92. Well, that's a long time that's since. A long time. So you were there? I was there <laughs> from 89 continuously. But in that time, my friends and family on the island would say, oh, teach hula, why don't you teach hula? I'm, oh no, too much work. Plus, I'm leaving anyway. <laughs> yeah, plus, um, my husband and I were very involved with the canoe club on Kauai, and he bought me a microwave. <laughs> I know it sounds, he says, I'm gonna buy you this microwave because I want you to come and be the coach for the women's crew on Kauai. And so I said, oh, well, when I went there, when I went there to be the coach, um, what happened was here were, you know, coming from Ho o Oahu, where everything was more systematic, I go to Kauai and I have people who don't run, they paddle when they want to paddle. I mean, it was, and they were wonderful, but, you know, it was a different lifestyle. Anyway, he said, we need to, help them to become long distance paddlers. Okay, now what does this have to do with the microwave? So he bought me the microwave because I said, I'm too busy, I can't do this. You know, you bought me the microwave, got me the classes, and I became the microwave queen. Anyway, come back to the canoeing. Why I even went on that tangent is, my mom came to visit me a couple of times. And you know, we have friends I'm on island, Everybody knows everybody. And in the years that I was there, I met different um, kumu. And so when my, my neighbor said, oh, can you teach us a song? We're gonna have this convention here. And I said, oh, let me send you to my friend. So I sent them to, um, to Kapu Kinimaka. Love that girl. Anyway, sent it to her. Well, these were older women. They were school teachers at Kapa School and um, just wanted to learn a hula so that they could share. Well, after about three days, my neighbor comes back. She goes, we can't dance over there. We cannot do the duck walks. The couple was progressive and young. 
So I said, oh, I have another friend. So I called Auntie Beverly Maroka. I sent them to Beverly. And Beverly was teaching down at the um, boats. Um, the learning would come in. And so her classes were right there in front of the learning coming in. So here are these school teachers who like everything to be exactly right, right? All learning hula with all these tourists around them. And so they come back again three days later. We can't be down there. We don't even know the songs, you know. Well, my mom happened to be home at my house. And she heard me talking to my neighbor again. And she says, how many times did you send them away? And I said, twice. She goes, this is the third time? I said, yes. She goes, no, you're not sending them away. She walked out. She said, come tomorrow. You folks will have hula over here. And that's really how I started to teach. It's because my mom was there, you know? Otherwise, I would have probably passed it on forward. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> but, but yeah, that she was, the, do you think she, that was meant to be? I believe so. Going to the big, uh, going to Kauai, um, my husband encouraged me. So he never, there was no, um, anything that I wanted to do, he, encouraged me to do it. But he loved the fact that I was not only doing the culture, but, you know, seeing where it was going and utilizing the things that I was taught as a young girl. You mentioned that two hurricanes <laughs> uh, kept you on Kauai, even though you had planned to move back to mm -hmm. Oahu. Um, what was your life like? Nikki really hit Kauai very, well, both hit Kauai hard. What was life like after that on Kauai for you? Oh, my goodness. You know, um, I was working at um, Smith's Flower Shop right at Wailua. And we had this big funeral. So I go to work that morning, and I'm doing all of this stuff for funerals. And what I notice is the peacocks in the garden are walking out of the garden in a line. And I'm saying, that is so unusual. And the Eva birds that you usually see in the mountains were now in the lower areas where I could see them outside of our flower shop. And my husband calls and he says, you've got to come home. You've got to go home. You know, this hurricane is really going to come. Anyway, I'm driving home and I see and on the open, uh, um, planes, cows and, and horses sitting on the ground. And they only do that when they're going to give birth or something, right? So, I mean, all of these signs were showing that things were different. Something was happening. My husband opens up all the windows, all the doors, and everyone's saying, go, you know, go up to the mountain, go to the school, because that's going to be the safer place to be. But he looked at the house, he says, there's concrete around here, we're staying right here. We had coconut tree right in front of the house. Anyway, when Iniki hit, um, it came like a locom locomotive, the sound, and the wind went right through our house. And our house was fine. We were perfectly fine. Then we hear the noise again. So here is Iniki coming the other half, because I didn't realize we were in the eye, other half. I saw a house that I was at, the open house, just a week before, falling off the mountain. You know, like the piano just falling off the mountain. Wow. It was at that time that I met my neighbors. So busy coming and going, I didn't know my neighbors. And my neighbors um, next door, the three girls, had really bad asthma. My brother, Kamohai, he sent a generator. I had the first generator in Anahola. Oh, that was so precious. <laughs> <laughs> and so we hooked up these girls because they needed it for their machines. I met the neighbor across the street, all the neighbor, and pretty soon we had all the kids at our house. And, you know, we would walk down to the beach to go and swim in the ocean because we didn't have running water. I mean, there were so many things we didn't have. In that time, getting to know the neighbors, getting to know the people, I think that Anahola community really came together and people not only knew one another, but took care of each other. Wow, so that uh, you've just described a powerful, destructive hurricane 
in, in terms of what, what great things it did for you. It did, and it did for the island. It made everybody um, appreciate, <laughs> lucky we live Hawaii, well, lucky we live Kauai. It made everybody appreciate what they had, and we have a lot, you know, simple is best. Puna Dawson's experiences of meeting remarkable people in history and living through significant events have all been part of her journey. Mahalo to Puna Dawson of Anahola and Lihue Kauai for sharing her stories with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha nui. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Along that theme of um, you coming in contact with leaders and um, just really uh, remarkable people, you had an interesting guest in the back seat of your broken down Subaru one day. Yes, I did. I called him Top Tim because that's what my brother said. His name was Top Tim. And in fact, he was? He was a Dalai Lama. A Dalai Lama. Yeah. And he was sitting in the back of your Subaru. Yes. Uh, so, holding your peacocky plants. Yes, yes. Um, he came to the island. My brother just said, my friend wants to come. And his name is Top Tim. When he came, because I didn't know who he was, I had no idea. And so I had all my buckets with the plants and stuff in the back seat. Because you worked in a flower shop. Yeah, and um, so I had to pick up all the flowers. And so when he said where he wanted to go, I said, well, I'm gonna go there, but we, we've gotta pick the flowers up on the way. And what was the Dalai Lama's reaction to that? Oh, he was, he was game. He's a fun-loving guy. We arrive at the airport and here he's sitting with my packages of peacocky, smelling wonderful. And the girls come out to help me, and they tell me, Auntie, Auntie, that's the chosen one. And I'm going like, yeah, I guess so. And so we proceed going inside, and the girl comes up, and she has the newspaper, and she shows it to me like this. And I turn to my brother, and I say, he goes, yeah, top 10 because he couldn't say the long version of the Dalai Lama's name. From that moment, it was like, oh my goodness. I just took this gentleman from one end of Kauai to the other end of Kauai. And covered him flowers, with plants. And covered him with plants. <laughs> I mean, literally, you could only see him here and everything else Did was around Did he make a comment him. about it? He said, oh, this is joyful. You know, he used that word joyful quite a few times. And he found humor in everything that we we're doing. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Yeah, it is. All I can say is I've been blessed. I've been really blessed.